Today's speaker is uh, Stephen Mark Carey. Professor Carey has published on medieval European lit literature with an emphasis on the 12th and 13th centuries and historical linguistics. Professor Carey is a Fulbright Fellow and has taught at Emory University, Georgia State University, and the University of Bergen in Norway. Professor Carey is currently chair of the German department and the professor at the University of Minnesota, Morris. Please sit back and welcome our, inst our, our fabulous <laughs> presenter today, Professor Carey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for the late start. Today we're going to talk about what Germany is or what German is uh, in terms of the broader history of Europe. So there's some pictures. One of the first things we find early on, and we do have several different one of these. I picked this one because it's the most famous one. It's the Venus of Willendorf. The, uh, <clears throat> the figure is about a 4.4 inch tall mother goddess figure that was found while they were uh, building um, train tracks through Austria in the little city of Willendorf in Wachovia, which is on the western side of Austria and also goes into what is now Hungary. Um, it's currently on display in Vienna, Austria, and the statue substantiates that there was a substantial, substantial culture in this area at least 20,000 years before the Common Era. And then we have the discovery of the Ötzi, the, the, the glacier mummy that was found uh, uh, less than 30 years ago. Uh, the man from Hauslavia, commonly called Ötzi, is a well-preserved glacier mummy dated from about 3400 to 3100 BCE. Um, <clears throat> And it's now um, Italy and Austria fight over who gets to um, store this mummy, and, and Italy won. And so it's on the Italian side in South Tyrol in a museum. Uh, but it's, again, it shows us advanced culture. It shows us hunting techniques. It shows us clothing. He's wearing pants. There was an advanced culture in this area. And then one of the most shocking ones that still has archaeologists and historians confused is the uh, Nebra Sky Disc. This is an accurate description of uh, you know, an accurate, an accurate astrological description of the heavens put on a plate that is dating back to at least 2,000 years, or the, the second century before Christ, or the second millennium before Christ. So it's a bronze disc, it's got applications. It's, they're probably religious themes. Some of those are probably boats instead of moons moving across the sky, but it definitely counts as one of the most important finds of the 20th century, and it shows that Germans weren't nearly as quote-unquote barbaric as we uh, tend to think they were. And there were other items found at the grave site. This was found by grave robbers who then got caught, and there was a back and forth dating of it to find out what it was, and it still is dating from about the second millennia uh, before the Common Era. And it's a shocking thing because we didn't think that Germans had this kind of advanced uh, astrological no astronomical knowledge. And then we have the Celts. If you see on this map, and you know your Bible, that Paul writes to the Galatians who are somewhere in Turkey, you can start to think about the fact that the Celts were all over Europe too. So here we have two groups that were spread out all over Europe, the Celts and what we ended up calling the Germans. So what's the difference? Well, the point is, is there is no difference. We created the difference. These peoples, we don't really have a cultural difference between them. This was part of 19th century antagonism between France and Germany. And if you do look at all the archeological evidence, uh, it's the same culture. So we're running through that problem that um, there is no real distinction in terms of material culture between what we would call Celts and Germans. And that is sort of an artificial distinction when you're starting about Germans. So here we have one of the first major, major discoveries of, of, of what we would consider to be German, a German cultural um, center in Austria. And the Hallstatt culture is named after a series of graves that are considered the, the, of considerable scope sound just above the town of Heistadt in the Salzkammergut of Austria. That would be then more closer Eastern Austria, or closer to Switzerland. Uh, Heilen is the high Alemannic word for salt. And if you have that in, in names, that's also what it means, um, and, and, and family names. The culture spans in the late Bronze Age and the early Iron Ages and divided into four periods. Now, we don't have to get too caught up in these times because you're going to see a French one that was found at the same time. It's almost exactly the same. They divide it up a little differently. They call it by a different name and a different place name. But what we did find out is that these two settlements were actually related 
Um, so the Latin culture you see there at the bottom runs parallel to the Hallstatt culture, and there's little to no difference between the two. Right, so it's in this area, it's up there in the mountains, very gorgeous there in Austria. And so here you have then the expanse of the Hallstatt culture, and you see that it runs all the way through France and into Spain. So where are Germans at this point? Um, well, they're in France and Spain, apparently. Um, <clears throat> And then you also see, when we consider the more immediate zone that they consider the Hallstatt zone, the Latin settlement is within that zone. Um, and so making this distinction that was you know, really pushed for in the 19th century to make the French and the Germans radically different, making the difference between these two cultures doesn't hold up. Um, it was the same culture. So where we have the Latin culture was a European Iron Age culture named after the archeological site, Latin. It's half of it is under the lake at Neuchâtel, <clears throat> and um, it's an extension of the Hallstatt culture. What we found out, this was probably a military encampment where they did executions and they did have some trading, and the main Hallstatt site was sort of the inhabitant encampment where most of the trading and uh, commerce was going on. Uh, the dates run parallel, but again, these are probably, uh, yeah, so this was probably not a town, but a military encampment from what we found, and there were probably both towns are probably related, and they weren't separate into two different groups of Celts and Germans. And again, you can see it there. So what we start with at the beginning is that the separation between Celts and Germans is artificial. So, uh, and then these, again, up here, you see the map again, the area, and these names are names that were given to uh, Germanic tribes by the Romans, and for many of them, we have no idea as to where they got them from, maybe from proper names, um, but they're not Latin, and they're sort of, uh, they switch, some of these groups will disappear, some of them we never heard of, like the Carnutes. They're mentioned once, we don't know where they were, we sort of think they were there. So we get all these ideas from the Romans, but the Romans have everything um, also from their perspective, and many of the people writing on these things, like um, Tacitus never actually went to Germania, so um, a lot of this is the information we have is hearsay. Now here's the wider area that you have about 700. You have people on the move, people coming in from the Crimean area, um, they were probably Goths. We find evidence of the Gothic language at, even at the end of the 18th century in the Crimea. So at least that Germanic tribe, how it came from the Crimea, but then others came from the north, from the area around Poland, and they start moving uh, south, and there are different reasons for them to move. They're gonna be under, of course, majorly underway by the second century CE. Then the first major sort of thing that we can say, it's within Germany, it's clearly German, it's later, it's the Jastorfkultur. Um, this developed out of the culture of the Germans moving um, south beyond the, from the north down through the Elbe area, or the, the Elbe River. And it's a series of burial sites, but uh, we found similar sites all through the area, so it's expanded down into Lower Saxony and Thuringia. Uh, the culture is believed to be the actual basis of what would become the uh, cultural and linguistic roots of the Germanic people. And on some of these things you'll find runic inscriptions. Runic inscriptions are rarely any kind of message. They're usually a name, some kind of religious uh, uh, nod to a god, or even most of them are signs of ownership, like uh, Tostin owns this sword. Um, so. Uh, Later, when the Anglo-Saxons become Christianized, you do get whole poems that were written out in runic, but that's rare. And at this point, you're pretty much just getting identifiers of ownership or blessings, uh, religious formulas. So the first contact with the Romans, where we get most of our information, we get sparse information from Greek writers, but we get most of our information about what these Germans would be, um, is from the Romans. And the first contact comes about 100 years before the Common Era. And we've got uh, a series of battles with the groups known as the Teutons, the Teutons, Teutonic. That's where we get that word. But they sort of get wiped out and vanish from history. They come down with the Kimbrian, which most people, the Cimbrians, which most people have never heard of. And they sort of mix in with the empire. They're defeated. They wander all over. You see, again, that area of wandering is basically from what would be the border of the Ukraine all the way into Spain. And this is our area of what's considered, quote unquote, German. So um, Caesar is one of the first persons who write extensively about, ex writes extensively about the Germans, but why? Why does he write about the Germans? He writes about the Germans because he needs money from the Senate. That's why he writes about the Germans. Um, there is no, again, distinct difference between the two cultures on the both side, sides of the Rhine, but politically, going to Rome or writing to Rome and saying, well, I've had troubles on this side of the Rhine, 
and I think have overcome them, but the people on the other side of the Rhine are even more dangerous, so send more money. That's pretty much how that works out. And the German, although this is fought forever, but it means spear man. Yeah, is a spear. It means a person of the spear. If you go through a lot of the names for German, Sachsen is from Sachse, from the sword. So if you go up to Finland and Estonia, they know the Germans as, as those guys with the short Roman swords. The, the Romans knew the Germans as the people with the spears. Uh, and if you go on an Alemannia, is another name for Germans that goes, uh, that goes to the river L, which is close to France. That's why they'll call it Alemannia the, uh, in French. And then finally, the uh, Deutsch, Tusk. It means people. So again, this, this mis mis mystery of who these people are is in the word German. Tusk is from Theodisk, Latin for the people, the folk. So, and that's also the irony when the Germans say, via sind das Volk, it goes back to the fact that the word German means Volk. So it shows also that, at least in, in the Latin there, that they didn't know who was there. It was just a bunch of people over there. Deutsch, das Volk. Um, and so uh, Caesar represents the Germans as being far stronger, more brutal than the Celts, in order to retain funding for his armies from the Senate. He establishes the Rhine as a border for his conquests in Gaul and treats the peoples on the other side with unbridled brutality. And there may have been a massacre because one entire tribe disappears and Caesar claims that he performed the massacre. So um, one of the things they did to uh, impress, terrify uh, the, the uh, peoples uh, north of the Alps was to do just simple feats of engineering. Building a Rhine across, uh, or a bridge across the Rhine absolutely terrified and amazed the peoples who, who lived there. And so that's one thing he did while he was there. And then his troops apparently slaughtered 40, uh, 430,000 people. And these were two tribes that were mentioned earlier that then just disappeared from the historical record. And they are the Usipeda and the Tenktera. And they just vanished from the face of the earth. We, we obviously can't go back and verify Caesar's exact um, Numbers. This is the place where they probably, near Koblenz, where they built the bridge over the Rhine. And so, according to the various Roman and uh, Greek sources, this is the situation we're going to have around closer to the beginning of the Common Era. You see, the Goths have moved from the Crimea all the way up to now what is the northern coast of Poland. And then you have these other groups that are still uh, on the um, western side of the Rhine. Uh, major groups like the Vandals and the, the, the Burgundians, and then you have the other groups that the Romans are sort of going to make peace with and interact with. And the Romans are slowly trying to move. You see that where the pink and yellow are, where the Rhine is coming down, but they're slowly trying to move over and take over area, uh, uh, take over the area east of there towards the Elbe. And basically, they never do that for a few reasons. One of them um, we're going to get to. The other one is that the Germans didn't really have major cities. These were farming communities with long houses. There wasn't, uh, as there would have been in the Middle East, major cities to run and conquer, or really much of a chance to get a pitched battle. Um, and so they tried to take over through you know, colonial aspects, trading hostages, going to a chieftain and saying, send your sons to Rome, and we'll raise them as Romans. And, uh, continue to pay us tribute and everything will be fine. That's sort of how they did things and that's how they interacted with these groups. But there are several Roman settlements on the Rhine that are now major German cities. We have the Colonia Ulpia Trania, which is Nijmegen, that's of course in um, the Netherlands. And then Ulpia Novio Magus Batorium, that's in Santin. And then Colonia Claudia Ara Agrippinsiensum Köln, one of the few Roman cities named after a woman, which was nice. And then Bona Bon, uh, Mangontachium, um, that's Mainz, Augusta Trevorum, Trier, and then Divodorum, Metz, uh, because of the silver there, uh, Agenturate, Strasbourg, and then Augusta, Windelacorum would be Augsburg. So all along the Rhine, these currently German cities were founded by the Romans. And then the Romans <clears throat> have this line all the way up there, and they're eventually going to build a wall there after. They have trouble. Yep, there, there comes the wall. The wall comes there. They're called the limes, the limits. The students always refer to them as the limes. But they do build a wall, and, and most of it is because of this person, Arminios. Uh, now, there's a statue in New Ulm of Arminios that's modeled perfectly after the, the statue in Detmold. So I have the picture of the one in, um, in New Ulm. He becomes a central figure of German nationalism in the late 19th century. 
Um, first of all, we don't know what his name was. His name certainly wasn't Herman, but one of the greatest raiders of all time gave him that name, and that was Martin Luther. Martin Luther decided to call Arminius Herman the German, and it stuck. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but that's over 1,500 years after this. So his German name is relatively unknown. He was one of these people. The Romans went to his father and said, we're going to make a deal. We're going to make trade deals. Your, your tribe has to pay taxes. And to make sure that happens, your sons are going to Rome as a guarantee. And then he was raised, however, as a Roman. They call them hostages, but Arminius would have been raised as a Roman nobleman. And he en enters the cavalry as an officer. So he's a cavalry officer, which is a pretty high rank within the Roman army at the end of the day. And what and he, uh, he goes on raids, um, um, puts down rebellions in um, Illyria, in areas you know, around Bosnia and Croatia and the Balkans. And then he gets a break to go home and see his father. Well, when he goes home, um, what of, often happen in these border towns is they're under supply. They're not getting the food provisions for the locals they were promised. They're not getting the pay they were promised. So corruption is rampant. A violation of the law is rampant. And then um, they sent. Varos up there, to, who had been in Syria, to sort of get the Germans in line, and the brutality ensued. Arminius sees this and sort of wants to help his, uh, his fellow, quote unquote, Germans, as Caesar called them. And uh, a national myth is born. They, he, the, at this point, and this was bad for the Romans, they kept forcing Germanic tribes to fight in their armies, and then the Germanic tribes knew their tactics. And so here you have a cavalry officer who completely knew the tactics. Now this is seen as a barbarian raid. It may have been motivated primarily by starvation, but what they did was, is through uh, the forest right outside of Osnabrück, they set up pass for the Roman army. The Roman army was coming back from its summer camp in Haltern, walking back towards the Rhine for its winter camp. And so they weren't in any sort of battle formation. They were almost walking, say, in threes, nearly single line for army. They had cows and everything else in tow. And the Germans had set up barriers, blocks, and sent them through a swamp area and raided them and just kept attacking them over three days until they destroyed two Roman legions, which was one unheard of at the time. And you can see that this doubt it lasted a few days because some of the cowbells we had found had, had grass stuffed in them. So the Romans are sort of walking through the forest, terrified in the rain, with Germans randomly coming out, picking them off for about three days. And this happened in the year nine, probably around the end of September. Um, and, the, and the Germans celebrated it massively in 2009, the 2000 year anniversary of the Battle of the Teutoburger Forest, or the Germans call it after the name of the Roman general who was defeated, they call it the, Var the Battle of Varus. So, so after going back to see his father, Segestes, and his wife, Tusnelta, um, Arminius gets involved in this um, conspiracy against the Romans, and they defeat two Roman legions. Uh, Augustus, who was the emperor at the time, is so upset, he runs around the uh, palace screaming, Varus, Varus, Vedes uh, Legiones, uh, Varus, Varus, give me my legions back. Uh, the 18th and 19th that were destroyed, those, those legion numbers never get used again. And um, the Romans decide to stop expanding in Germania. And this is important because this changes Western history. We get the development, or at least not the entirely uh, 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 you know, uh, affected development of German. So because of Arminius, we probably have the German language as it is now. Major, major important step. And then secondly, there was no Roman barrier in the north there. So when the Huns and other tribes start moving, uh, moving westward, uh, they're just going to be overrun. There's no Roman army there. There's no Roman civilization there. So there are two major reasons why this changed history. One of them is because we get the German language. Uh, the second one is then that the migration of peoples uh, is able to take place with no significant Roman resistance. I'm going the wrong way. Oh, turn this upside down. But we see still here that these people, um, the so-called Germans, there's Tuznelda. Tuznelda, uh, the Romans go back up. They find the German ritual site. Oftentimes, the Germans would um, slaughter um, enemy soldiers um, and hang them in trees, um, blood eagle them to, to worship the gods. And they would also bury a significant amount of the uh, booty that they took during the battle, including the weapons. And these were all found. The Romans are enraged. They go on a series 
of campaigns. They get the father, Segestes, to be part of a conspiracy that poisons Arminius. Arminius dies, and then they take his poor wife, Tuznelda, who's pregnant, and torture her to death uh, before a cheering crowd in a Colosseum in Ravenna. But she was seen in German history as being part of the conspiracy to kill Arminius with her father. So to this day, her name is a slur for women in Germany. If you call someone a Tussi, it's a very bad word. But very few Germans know that that insult goes back to the wife of uh, Arminius. So here we have the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th legions. This was a planned attack. It happened uh, probably around September 25th, which is the Feast of St. Michael. Um, uh, in the year 9 CE, um, again, yeah, uh, uh, August, uh, Augustus is not happy. He wants his legions back, and the punitive actions are severe but largely ineffective. And here we can see the area. Um, they were walking back to the Heiton am See, which is in the Ruhr area near Dortmund. They were walking from, uh, from around the Elbe area in Haltern, and they go through the wooded area above Osnabrück, in the Kaiflise, and that's where the battle took place. Previously, they thought it was south of Bielefeld in Detmold. That's why the famous Hermann the German statue is there. But it actually took place north of the city. And then, of course, he's still a very popular figure in Germany now. And then if you've ever seen the Che Guevara, uh, popular things, they've done that for uh, Hermann the German with his Che Ruska. And there's the original monument in Detmold. So again, briefly, I've mentioned some of this. Our main sources for information about the Germans are the Romans and the Greeks. Uh, primarily, um, Cornelius Publius Tacitus. Uh, he's a famous political theorist who also writes a lot about history and theory. Uh, but he writes this little book on the Germans. So what was the purpose of writing the book? It was mostly to criticize Romans. At the end of the day, Tacitus did not know much about Germania or the Germans. But he knew that the Romans were corrupt. So much like Rousseau and the, and the idea of the noble savage, what he does is he takes these people he doesn't know anything about and makes them more superior to the Romans in order to criticize the Romans. And then another source is uh, Cassius Dio, who uh, uh, writes in Greek. And this is a history written over a period of 22 years, and it co covers nearly 1,000 years of Roman history. And so there we get a, a pretty decent amount of information about the Germans. Um, just from the Germania, and you can see certain things from the Roman perspective. Um, th this was written during the reign of Augustus by Tacitus. Uh, the climate of Germania is foreboding and barren. There are endless forests and swamps, but no fruit trees. The Germans would have to be the original inhabitants of this land because who would leave Italy, Africa, or Asia to move to Germany? <laughs> in these patriasite, if it were not his homeland. Uh, the Germans do not have gold or silver, and they are not particularly interested in it. Completely false. Even the oldest stories we have are about people being interested in gold and silver. Um, as far as the description of the uh, landscape, that's what it would have been like. This is why it was so hard to conquer. And there weren't major areas of, of agriculture even set up to sort of raid. Uh, they, they elect their kings from the nobility. The most courageous among them become the generals. No one uh, was allowed to beat or execute those be below them. There was no absolute or central authority above them. This is Romans trying to st struggle to understand a relatively democratic system. Um, there, of course, were executions and beatings, but if you were of a free noble rank, you were able to have an equal vote and you had full protection of the law. And that's sort of how the Germanic system went. And they didn't exactly uh, elect kings, they, they, they had war band leaders. So uh, women are considered to be sacred among the Germans. The Germans were still worshiping uh, natural gods, the mother god. So this would have been uh, natural too. The Germans kept very strict marriages. Uh, in Germania, no one laughs about vice and seducing, and being seduced are not considered to be modern. Tacitus is writing at the same time Ovid is writing. Um, every woman has only one man, and she has only one body and one soul. Germanic families produce many children. In Germania, Germania, good morals achieve more than good laws do elsewhere. And then again, the role of women in this culture was probably um, the, one of the most free in Europe. And uh, as the areas become Christianized in Scandinavia, you could say that basically that women in Scandinavia and Germany had more rights in 1350 than they did in 1950. They're getting most of them back, but women legally were equal partners. They were allowed to own land. They were allowed to divorce at will. And then the idea of being able to give birth was very sacred, as for many cultures. And so women were considered to be somewhat holy 
So all of the holy people, the holy women, the people making the decisions at the end, in the Germanic tribes were women, they were consulted, the women showed up at many of the battles, uh, et cetera. So a very different situation than, than would have been familiar to the Romans. The men are large and powerful with physical uh, symmetry, light skin, blue eyes, and blonde hair. This is where this comes from. These would have been Swedes. In fact, the Germans who are really tall with blue eyes and blonde hair are Swedes that came down in the Thirty Years' War and settled in, in Pomerania. Um, um, and blonde hair. German boys experience their first taste of sexual pleasure later in life so that their virility is not drained when they reach full manhood. Again, this is criticizing Roman. <coughs> This is criticizing more Roman cultural habits at the time under the reign of Augustus than anything that we actually know about the Germans. And the mention of the light skin, blue eyes, and blonde hair is varied, but this would have been the, um, in the Roman market the thing that sold the best is the blue hair and the blue eyes. Uh, on the other hand, they are big drinkers, and one is more easily able to defeat them with alcoholic beverages than with weapons. <laughs> they lay upon bear skins and often drink more than they can handle. They are also incorrigible gamblers and players of dice, and especially beloved game. Often while playing dice, they are not only gamble away their possessions, lands, wives, and children, but also even their own personal freedom. So the dice games are big, uh, and, and the drinking as well. The, um, the German drinking ceremonies are, I think there is even a rat's color at the university here, but rat's colors are basically, basically the cellar of the city hall. Why would you put a bar in the cellar of the city hall? Well, it goes back to the thing culture of the Germans. If they had a major, major decision, of course they would first consult the wise woman, uh, but they would also come together and discuss it. And one of the traditions was on the first night, everybody leaves the weapons to the side, everybody gets drunk and talks about it. And then you sleep on it, and two days later, you come back and talk about it sober. And the idea was that if everybody drank and talked about it, they would say exactly how they'd feel, and they'd come up with a solution. Ergo, one of the reasons why there are bars in the basements of German city halls. Um, there is a long-standing enmity between individual Germanic tribes, and as long as this animosity persists, Rome does not need to worry about the security of the empire. Therefore, it must prevent the unification of the Germans. And even a small unification of the Germans, which Armenius performed, which was not easy, namely getting Germanic tribes, even in that small area around Osnabrück, to fight together, was not an easy task. And the Romans always had the benefit that the Germans were not united. So these are various collections of people of the north. They're identified as war, a warlike people different from the cults for political uh, uh, advantage so that Caesar can get the funding he needs. Um, we don't really have a major cultural difference between these two groups, but because of the influence of the Latin language within uh, France and Spain, we're going to get, a, and, and the inability of the Romans to expand really beyond the Rhine in Germany, we're going to get a German language. And so the first Germanic sound shift will signify a transition from Indo-European to Germanic, and this happens around 500 BC. What does that mean? Well, that's when, when English was invented. English does go through the first Germanic sound shift. German is special because it goes through the second one, which comes later at 800. But all the languages that you would identify as Germanic and English and all the Scandinavian languages and Dutch and German, they would be coming to be in their first first eminences of being at this point. And at this point, you know, well up into the year 1000, German and things like um, English and the Scandinavian languages were mutually intelligible. Right, so, um, so a thousand years ago, you could speak German, is another way of putting it. Uh, the Germans are not in an eth ethnicity. They're a, a, a rather collective term for many different peoples with widely varying heritage, cultural and eth eth ethnicity and cultural organization. In fact, identifying somebody as German as an ethnicity does not occur until the 16th century. In Steiermark in Austria, we find a book of ethnicities from the 16th century where finally somebody is identified as being Deutsch. But that's a very, very late idea. And most, for the most part, the Germans are being defined as German from the outside, or throughout most of the history, they're defined as a broad linguistic community. And this linguistic community would have gone all the way down to the Black Sea and into France. So it was a very large linguistic community speaking German. A lot of this uh, was disrupted and destroyed by the Nazis. When they murdered the Eastern European Jewry, they also murdered all the German speakers out in what is in Eastern Europe um, and nearly wiped out a form of music, klezmer music, um, but that survived as well. So, but then in, in any case, before even 1945, German was a language that was spread all throughout Europe, especially in the East. 
So then we get to the period of the so-called migrations of peoples. This is where things really change, and this is where you get to a point uh, where you have to accept the fact that every European country is German, because they're all over the place. So if these people were Germans, then, then everywhere is basically German, including Germania, but we have Longobards in Italy. We have uh, Visigoths, also called West Goths. Visa doesn't mean West, it means noble, and they were called the Noble Goths because originally they were fighting for the Romans. Uh, the Visigoths, and the Ostrogoths does mean East, they're just the East Goths, but the Nice Goths, the noble ones that fought for them. So they're down in Spain, they push the Vandals out. The Vandals take over North Africa, uh, and you have basically the Goths all through the Eastern Empire and through Italy, and other groups come in. So then you have Germanic tribes all over Europe. So who are these people exactly? Well, there are people being chased by Attila, and that's why they're coming. The, the Huns, the Mongols, move across uh, uh, Eurasia and head into Europe and start pushing groups ever further east. You see the East Goths up there are right near the Crimea. This is why we found evidence of the Gothic language in the Crimea uh, in the 18th century. And they keep pushing them and pushing them. The Romans are getting pressured by the people being pushed by the Huns. So the Goths show up along the Roman border there in the east where the Bosphorus is, and they want to get in the Roman Empire because they're basically not wild, brutal warriors. They're farmers. And they, ha they can do nothing to, to ward off the Huns. Uh, the Huns were on horseback with bows, uh, very strong reverse bows. This will be something that will be hard to defeat until the development of firearms, actually. So it wasn't surprised that they were running from them. But they uh, petitioned the Emperor Valens to get into the empire, and he says, okay, well, some of you can come into the empire, but you have to leave your weapons on the other side of the Danube, and we'll give you land, and we'll feed your children if you fight our armies. And they say, okay, so they cross... They cross the river, this is around 350 BCE. Well again, the supplies weren't worked out, the logistics weren't worked out, the border troops are stuck with people in camps, they can't feed them, um, corruption sets in, they start trading dog meat to people for their children to be sold into slavery. Um, there are all kinds of horrific stories of what's going on in the border because of the food shortages. And the Goths, not being completely helpless, didn't leave all of their weapons on the other side of the Rhine. So then they rebel, and the Romans are basically uh, uh, taken by surprise. They uh, devastate the whole area, and by 378, the emperor himself shows up on the battlefield to fight uh, uh, the Goths under a, under a, um, a leader named Fritigern at Adrianople, short, north of Adrianople, and uh, down there in the Crimea. It's, it's actually in, in, in what is part of the European part of Turkey today. And um, he's completely defeated. They, they went with arrogance. They went in the heat. The Germans used, I'm not going to describe the battle in detail, but the Germans were experienced Roman troops, most of them, fighting against Roman troops. Uh, and they annihilated two thirds of the army. About 15 to 20,000 Romans died, including the emperor. And having an emperor die on the battlefield was quite a shock. Uh, but more shocks will come as the Germans begin moving across. One of the other shocks is that the Vandals, who were not a seafaring people, get pushed to the bottom of Spain, of what is now Spain, by the Visigoths, suddenly learn how to build ships, and they, they actually get involved in Roman intrigue. A Roman general named Aetius, who is battling the Roman general in charge of North Africa, which at this point was the bed, bread basket. You just, when we think of you know, Northern Africa as deserts, think of it as wheat fields, because that's what it was for the Roman Empire. This is where they got fed. So Aetius is in Rome, his rival uh, Boniface is in Northern Africa, and he says to the Vandals, he says, hey, if you would, uh, or Boniface says, hey, if you will come and fight with me against the Romans, because Aetius is gonna come after me, then I'll give you land here and you can settle here in Northern Africa. Well, he changes his mind when they arrive, and so they end up plundering the entirety of Northern Africa uh, uh, under their leader, Geyseric, and they end up in 410 actually sacking Rome, but uh, they don't stay there. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Goths under Alaric end up sacking Rome in 410. The Vandals will sack it in 476 from Northern Africa. So you see here, just to get these maps, that there are people moving all over. So when we're talking about a unified group that has ancient roots, this can't be it. And this often happens, as I said, tribes disappear because they get blended into other tribes. Uh, even the area of Bavaria is a good case in point. 
Uh, there is no tribe called Bavarians until later, and that's sort of a sort of a catch-all term for about 20 different tribes in that area. So then again, um, you know, stating specific cultural units or things like that, that's just not what it was. These people were wandering, other starving people will join in. Uh, and this is the, basically the state of things as things are sort of, it takes a while for things to sort of sort out, but you have the Visigoths in Spain, and the Visigothic kingdom in Spain will remain there until the seventh century when um, the Muslims move in, uh, when the caliphate, uh, the Umayyad caliphate moves in from North Africa. And then you have the Eastern Roman Empire, which under Justinian, especially in the sixth century, sort of restrengthens their fighting enemies on both sides. Uh, and then you have uh, the kingdom of Odoacer. At this point, the Goths had already taken over Italy, declared themselves emperors, and that's why we pretty much say that 476 is the end of the Holy Roman Empire. So where are these Germans we were looking for? Are they in Italy? Well, yes, yeah, some of them are. If they were all Germans coming from the East, then some of them are Italy, some of them are in Spain. And so then you're, you're stuck with the, with, the, um, with the situation that the Germans didn't only found the, you know, what became the modern state of Germany, they founded France. It, it is, after all, the kingdom of the Franks. The Franks are a Germanic tribe. They founded Spain, and they founded Italy. Um, these are all Germanic peoples settling in these areas. The situation in Spain, as I was just describing, with the Vandals being sort of pushed as the Romans moved down to the south and becoming shipbuilders and eventually going across North Africa, taking over Carthage, and then sailing to Rome in 476 and sacking it. Um, and that's officially when we do, at this point, the Roman Empire, the capital had been moved to Ravenna because it's safer. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at, <laughs> at where they went, and the kinds of peoples and cultures they could have been involved in as they move all the way down and end up in Spain. I mean, this is the entirety of Europe. So when we're talking about some sort of ancient or ethnic Germanness, it just doesn't exist unless you consider all of Europe to be German. And you can see them moving down there. Um, the Visigothic Kingdom in Spain is particularly important for several reasons. One is that, um, we don't have time to go into this, but there are, the Germans, when the Goths get Christianized, they get Christianized in Aryan Christianity. And the basic uh, theological problem is that the Aryans don't believe in Trinitarian um, theology. They believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three different things. Not one. That's a major violation of Catholic dogma. So the Catholics and the Aryan Christians, most of whom were, were, were uh, Eastern Goths, were Ostrogoths, were constantly fighting. But for a brief period of time, you had an Aryan. Arius is not related to Aryan, as in Germans, as in these fictional Indo-Europeans who are supermen, but Arius, a, a, a third century Christian who had a different idea of how Trinitarian dogma. This is the thing that inspired the Council of Nicaea, if you're Christian and you and you read that, um, that's what they're arguing against. They're arguing against Arianism. Um, and this remains, remains a point of contention. And so when the Visigoths move, in, or when the Goths move into Spain, they basically are a different form of Christianity. They're odds with the Catholic Church. And when they move into Northern, and this plays a constant role in the history of the Church, when they move into Northern Africa, there are many Arians there. So they're both fighting Catholics and liberating their fellow Christianists in Arianism. And this sticking point with Arianism also explains how um, the, um, the Muslims took over North Africa in less than 100 years. They weren't fighting wars. They were going in and saying, hey, the Catholics in Constantinople are trying to kill you because you have a different idea of Christianity than they do. We'll just make you pay a tax. Could you open the doors? And that's literally how they walked across North Africa. Um, <laughs> And so that's also a huge uh, part of this, that there's little religious wars going on, particularly among uh, Aryan Christians and Catholics. And I just want to jump through a lot of this. Uh, and then eventually it becomes this Spanish kingdom of Spain. So where does this get us? I know we're running short on time, but this gets us to the Merovingians. They're French. The Merovingians are French. And the, but this is where a lot of the old Germanic stories come from. This is the inner house fighting, the brutality. Um, and what happens is, is that um, Clovis, king of the Franks, allows himself to be baptized. Now we get this from Gregory of Tours, and as I'm mentioning Gregory of Tours, he's a, a, a Christian monk, a writer, a, a bishop actually, in Tours, in the sixth century, who writes a history of the Franks in that area, the Franks around the Rhine, and the Franks are gonna start around Tournai and eventually take over all of France. 
right? And so when he tells the story of how Clovis was baptized, he basically tells the story of Constantine the Great um, in that Clovis prayed before the battle and he was gonna fight under the symbol of the, of the uh, Christian church and he does and he wins so he allows himself to be baptized. So it's a typical uh, battle conversion story but the, uh, the conversion of Clovis has enormous effects. Now what was the real motivation for many of these Germanic kings being um, Christianized? Well, you get all the bureaucracy of the Catholic Church. You get people who can write, you get people who can count your sheep, you get people who can write to other uh, letters, you get people who can keep uh, uh, to other rulers, you get people who can keep records. So really the bureaucracy was the main attraction. And then also you get plugged in and then even more you get legitimacy. You get God-given legitimacy to your rulership and as the Roman Empire had collapsed, this becomes one of the most important legitimizing factors. Whereas the original, the Merovingians are named after a river god called Mero. So they're actually descended from river gods and Clovis is part of a Germanic god. But that kind of legitimacy wasn't working anymore. So having the legitimacy of the full uh, bureaucratic power of the Catholic Church was what a lot of these Germanic leaders were going for. And then of course Clovis unites the kingdoms and creates the kingdom of the Franks. It's a Germanic kingdom, but that's eventually what will become France. But you can already see in this map, um, and this is the expansion, that it's starting to include parts of what we now call Germany. Well, why? Well, because they're, they're all Germans. When Charlemagne has what they call the Carolingian Re Renaissance, and he tells them to put, uh, to write things in the language of the people, he means German. He spoke German. This is why our days of the week are modeled after the days of the week in the Romance languages. They have Mahdi, which is named after the god Mars, and we have Tuesday, Tuesday, also a war god day. They have Mercredi, we have Wednesday, right? Voltanstag, Odin's day is Wednesday, Thor's day, Thursday, Freya da, uh, Freya's day, Freya's the goddess of love. That's why they call it Vandi in the Romance language. This is the day of Venus. So this is all set up by Charlemagne, but realizing that Charlemagne's native language was German, right? So, um, and then these are the kingdoms that develop out of that. Uh, at the same time, again, we have a lot to cover. There's a lot to cover originally in this, and I came late, which I apologize for. But you see the expanse of this empire. And again, a lot of it had to do with the people in North Africa were getting tortured by the Byzantines for not believing in the same Trinitarian theology. And they just didn't have to deal with that under uh, the Muslims, so they didn't. And that was one of the big reasons for the expansion and the quickness of the expansion of those kingdoms. But they eventually move in and they end up in the middle of France, right? Where you see where uh, Toulouse and Poitiers, Poitiers is the high point. So they were moving into France and they finally get stopped by uh, Charles the Hammer, um, Carletus Martel, who is uh, Charlemagne's grandfather. Uh, and there's Pippin and Carl Martel. And there's the Battle of Poitiers, done very dramatically, except the, oh, the pregnant, the woman in the middle with the baby, was she on the way to CVS to get diapers and got caught up in this battle? I, I just don't ever really know how she ended up there, but uh, this is, of course, from the 19th century. But the Battle of Poitiers is still used by people, sort of, sort of the Christian West, defeating uh, invaders from the outside. And then we have Pippin the Short. And what happens is that the, the Pippinites, so the Carolingians were basically the major domos of the house. They were the people who ran the finances, who dealt with the day-to-day -day issues. And the Merovingian kings were increasingly removed from that, and so the Carolingians simply took over. Uh, they organized the thing, they got the pope to bless them, and they eventually take over the kingship of France, and then we get the introduction of Charlemagne. And of course, Charlemagne really plays up the idea that he is going to be the protector of the church because he knows the power, the pan-European power lays there and then he knows that it makes it easier to rule that way. Um, but he does, as I just mentioned, he gets things written in the German language because that's his language. He also fights the Saxon wars, which I'm going to have to skip if you have questions about those at the end. Um, this treaty, the Treaty of, of Verdun, not to be confused, this is the first this is the first example, these are the Str Strathburg Ides, these are the first example of a distinctly German, French, and Latin language. Because one of the things during the reign of Charlemagne, they realized that what they were speaking wasn't Latin, it was French. 
the, their, their vulgar Latin had become a different language than Latin. And Charlemagne was completely terrified because it turned out that they were praying to the Father, Son, and the Holy Sister. And so <laughs> he thought that God was misunderstanding their prayers. And so he creates a renaissance by inviting all of these Irish and English monks into Europe to reestablish proper Latin. And at the same time, gives birth to French as a separate language. So by 800, French, German, and Latin are written down as separate languages. And these are the, well, the, the treaty is basically splitting. The problem with the Merovingians, the reason why they had a hard time lasting, is that they didn't have um, direct inheritance of the first son. They would divide whatever they had as a kingdom up between all the sons. And then the usual uh, cycle was a period of chaos in which there was civil war between all the sons. That's how Charlemagne, Charlemagne's brother, uh, Carloman, Carloman's wife, and two children, where are they? Well, they were killed by Charlemagne, right? So this is how the Carolingians sort of came to power, and it led to a huge amount of chaos. So uh, Louis, Louis the Pious, who was Charlemagne's son, he takes his three sons, and we say, well, we'll divide this peacefully. You're going to all get your peace. And um, again, it doesn't work. And so you have Ludwig der Deutsche, Louis the German. He gets the area all the way uh, towards the uh, east, which is now Germany. And then you have Lothar. Lothar is going to be crowned as the official leading emperor. And Lothar is also going to get the middle kingdom, right, where Alsace-Lorraine Alsace is, which is called the Elsass. Lorraine because the Elsass River is there and because it was Lothar's kingdom, the Middle Kingdom. And then Charles the Bald, who's going to have a lot of fun adventures with Vikings, becomes the leader of the kingdom of the Franks in the west. And so you see that green area in the middle. The Treaty of Verdun is 743. The last time the Germans and the French fought over that green area was 1945. So what you have as a situation is that Lothar dies instantly or dies like really shortly after this deal is made, and the two brothers, Louis the German and uh, Charles the Bald, are gonna fight over that area in the middle. And they're gonna fight over it for over 100, for 1,200 years, right? And so that's, that's where the contention between Germany and France for Alsace-Lorraine comes from. It comes from Lothar, who died right away after this deal, the Treaty of Verdun was made in 743. And then here you can see it, and that sets up Europe as it is today, you have, in the blue, you have France, and there where the orange is, you're gonna get a developing Germany, and that middle area is sort of contested. So, and there are lots of fights. So we're gonna speed this up a bit. Here's, here's a famous poem from the Middle Ages. This is Walter von der Vogelweide. And due to uh, time constraints, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing, but this is a concept of German as a cultural unity, as a linguistic unity. It says, right, uh, ihr, sollt, uh, uh, ihr sollt sprechen willkommen, der ihr mehrere bringe, das bin ich. Alles, das habt ihr vernommen, das ist gar ein Wind. Ihr fraget mich, ich will aber Miete, wird mir nun gut, ich gesage euch, lüte sanfte tut. So, you should, tell, you, should, you should give me great greetings and, and welcome me, because I will sing for you. And if you think the song is good, you should pay me. And then he goes on, talking about the... Uh, the customs and virtues of German women, of German men, and of the German tongue. And when he's talking about the German tongue or the German language, if you look to the right, he says up there, von der Elbe uns an den Rhin und Herr Rieder uns an Ungarland, mogen wohl die besten sehen, die ich in der Welt erkannt. So this is a, a wide spread. It's from the Elbe all through the Rhine, down through Hungary. And these are all areas where people are speaking German. So a linguistic concept. Now you get this later, and this gets politically misused. It's, of course, the German, das Deutschland, die Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, das Lied der Deutschen. Um, this was originally done in that sense. When the song was written in the 1830s, there was no German nation. But there was a hyper-building German nationalism. Um, the song, of course, will then feed entirely into German nationalism and expansive concepts. The first time it was sort of sung in the military, though, is important, is, is during World War I in 1917. And then, of course, the Nazis will use that idea of Germany, Germany everywhere as a, a very destructive political tool. 
But the point is, is that there are Germans all over Europe. So that the European, whatever those people were, Caesar was calling that were on the other side of the Rhine, they're all over Europe. And so when we talk about, um, the, the most ridiculous place to talk about ethnic purity would be Germany. It was the middle, the middle ground of Europe. Everybody walked through it, right? Even, even if you looked something back that changed, again, I mentioned it with the Swedes, but changed the ethnic the, uh, demographics of Germany by introducing Spanish, Irish, Scandinavians was the Thirty Years' War. So all of the wars in Germany definitely changed that as well. So when we start to think about German as an ethnicity, it doesn't work. And when we think about a culture, it's a mix of so many different cultures across the ages. And thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kerry. Thank you. Thanks so much.